Now, Christmas, of course, is probably the favorite holiday of, of lots of people. Of course, we have get-togethers with families, friends, we have lights, uh, decorations, and of course, presents. It's a great holiday for all those things. But of course, Christmas is a lot more than just those good things. Christmas is, of course, when we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. But often, remembering that gets kind of lost, doesn't it? At least it does for me in the busyness that often happens in the, in the month of December. And this is why the, church, the Christian church celebrates what we call Advent, which we just did here this morning. People through the centuries have taken time in the weeks before Christmas, usually four weeks before Christmas, uh, to, you can do it daily or weekly to remind themselves of the importance of Christ's coming, his advent. And that's what the word advent means. By the way, it just means coming. It's when he came. So people would use things like a wreath like we have here and uh, with the candles. And we'd light one each week. And they remind us of certain aspects of Christ's coming. Now, each week there'd be a theme and scripture verses to go along with that theme. And it can be varied. You can do all kinds of different things with it. Today, we're looking at God's promises, as we've already heard, regarding the Savior, which God's people have trusted in, which they have hoped for, uh, for God to fulfill what he said that he would do. Now, often the first candle is the candle of hope, and it's usually hope slash promise, and we're kind of zooming in a little more on the promise aspect of it. So we're going to look at three promises, specifically that God made, that were fulfilled in Jesus when he came. The first promise was made to the first people, Adam and Eve. These first people, this promise was made uh, when they had messed up what God gave them. And they brought some pretty serious consequences of their disobedience on themselves and on every single one of us since then. And this is what they messed up. Basically, God gave them one thing, just one thing to not do. But the consequence of doing that, if they did it, would be death. And here it is in Genesis 2, 15 to 17. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the guard and the Lord, sorry, the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, many of you know what happened. Basically, a serpent came along, made some really uh, sly suggestions about stuff, about God, uh, to Eve and so on, and they ate the fruit. They disobeyed God. And the immediate result was that they were ashamed because they were naked. God hadn't, they were, that's how God created them. And they were like, whoa, what's going on here? And they hid from God. That's the second thing they did. Sin had become alive in them. And their relationship with God had died, and they, they felt it immediately. When God confronted them, of what did you do? They made excuses, and they did not admit their guilt. So God pronounced some curses, some severe consequences to each of them. And he started with the serpent. He started with the serpent, then he went to the woman, then he went to the man. And the serpent is, of course, the devil. And uh, as early as this in the Bible, though, we're going to hear about Jesus' coming. It won't be there in name, but it'll be there. So God promised Satan and all people that an offspring of the woman would rescue people from those consequences, the consequences of the sin, which is death. Genesis 3.15, it says, I will put, this is uh, God speaking to the serpent here, to Satan. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall crush your head and you shall crush his heel. Now, when you, if we don't have a whole lot of snakes around here. We don't really have dangerous ones, maybe rattlesnakes if you're in the right area. But when a snake attacks somebody, they do it in a sneaky way. Usually, as you're walking by, they whoosh, grab your heel and get you. Whether you or an animal, they'll, they'll get you in that kind of way, get up to your lower leg or something like that. And it's, it's kind of sneaky, and it causes injury. Now, if it's a really poisonous snake, it could kill you. But if it's just, you know, not so poisonous snake, it could definitely cause you some injury. And God said that Satan would do this in some way to the offspring of the woman, that he would hurt that person. Satan would have power to wound that person. That's what he's saying there. But God also said that the person that he's striking would crush the snake's head. You know what that means? What happens if your head gets crushed? You're dead. You're dead. 
That's a killing blow. So the promise of destroying the serpent was long understood by the people of Israel to refer to a promised savior, a rescuer that God was going to send. And a rescuer was definitely needed because of those further consequences that God pronounced for the woman and for the man uh, because of their sin. Remember, God said, if they ate the fruit, that in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, if you notice, when you read it, though, God did not strike them dead immediately. So was he not keeping his word? Did he not mean what he said? Well, he definitely meant what he said. They really did die immediately in a spiritual sense. The relationship with God was basically cut off. As I already noted, sin was alive. Uh, the disobedience and rebellion were in their hearts towards God, and they feared him. The first thing they did is they hid from him, and that was immediate. Now, physical death was also going to happen, but by God's grace, it wasn't immediate. He had grace on them. He did not. He could have struck them dead right away. He did not do that. The literal Hebrew there says in the command, it says, uh, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. The literal Hebrew is dying. Uh, to die, you will die. Basically, the Hebrew is repeating, repeating it to emphasize it. Basically saying that the process of death is going to happen. One other way I've heard it said is that dying, you will die. And here's what God pronounced against the man. Genesis 3.19. It says, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until, sorry, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust. And to dust you shall return. So God was saying, you are going to physically die. He could have rightly and justly, like I said, killed them right on the spot. But in his mercy and grace, he didn't. But he did pronounce they would die. They would, he would return to the ground. And in Genesis 5.5, 5, if you read a little further, it says Adam lived, I think it was 930 years, and he died. So he did. And every human's physical life, every one of us since Adam, comes to an end at some point. So a savior is needed. This is the whole point. Someone who can save people from the power of sin and death, as well as rescue us from our separation from God. On our own, we as humans, we can't reconcile ourselves to God because we all sin. We're all, we, ever since Adam, we all carry on doing that. We're disobedient to God, and we so we deserve God's punishment. We need a savior. We need a rescuer. We need someone who would crush the serpent's head, essentially. And God promised he would send him. The second promise that God gave of this Savior narrowed down where the Savior would come from. And what group of people the Savior would come from Abraham. Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And here's the promise. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In Galatians, we're told directly that this was speaking of that Savior, that person who is to come, Jesus. In the nation of Jews was to be a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. God made them a special people, revealing himself to them in a way he did to no other people. The Jewish people in turn, though, were to bring the knowledge of God to all the other people, all the other people around them. And most importantly, the promised Savior would come through these people. God promised Abraham's descendants would be a blessing to all the families of the earth, and that all the people's well welfare in some way, their well-being, would be advanced somehow through the Jewish people. And then, God narrows down even further the promise of his Savior in his third promise that he made to King David. A promise of a forever king. Somebody who would rule for God. We find that in 2 Samuel 7.16. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Now, God said that to King David. Now, if you think about King David, he lived for a while. He ruled. He ruled really well. He was called a man after God's own heart. But eventually, he died. And then Solomon, his son, became king. And he ruled for a while. And then he died. And then his son, Rehoboam, became king. And 
so on and so on, until uh, basically we had Babylon come along and take captive the whole nation. They hauled them off to Babylon, um, including the king that they had at that point. And ever since then, even though they've come back to, to live in Israel, there has been no king from David over Israel. So how can David's throne be established forever? Because there is still a forever king coming. There is someone else. Someone who is a descendant of David would come and would be a forever king because God had promised it. So those are three promises. And those are the three main things that God's people, Israel, had hoped for from God. And remember, hope isn't, isn't just airy-fairy, I, I really wish something would happen. It's, it's trust with a good reason. You can trust what God says. It's not wishful thinking. They trusted God would do it. The first thing he promised was a savior. A rescuer who would take care of sin and death, crushing Satan's head. The second thing he promised was that through Abraham's descendants, all people of the earth would be blessed. And then the third thing he promised that through a descendant of David, a forever king would come to rule for God. And the coming of Jesus fulfilled those promises. Matthew 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. When Jesus was born, he was a Jew, a descendant of Abraham. Even more, he was of the family of, the, of David the king. And this is what the angel told, told to, to, to Mary when he told her that he, she would give birth to Jesus. Luke 1, 32 and 33. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. Do you hear that? Jesus is the forever king who was promised to David. Of his kingdom there will be no end. In his birth, Jesus also fulfilled that promise exactly that was given to that serpent, to Satan. Remember back in Genesis 3.15, I read this earlier. I'll put enmity, be this is what God said to the serpent. I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will crush your head and you, and you will, will crush his heel. It says that the offspring of just the woman would crush the serpent's head. And Jesus was born exactly like that. He was born of just a woman and no man. He was born of Mary, the Virgin Mary. He was her offspring by the Holy Spirit and not by Joseph. Matthew 1, 18, we saw this this morning, it was read to us earlier. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But he considered, as he considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Jesus was the offspring of only a woman and was born to be the savior of the people. When the shepherds were in the field and the angels came and declared to them that Jesus was born, this is what they said, for to you is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. Jesus came to rescue people from the penalty of their sins. He came to save people. Satan wants people to perish. He wants people to die without any hope of being with God, simply because he hates God. But God sent Jesus so that people would not perish, but would be with God forever. John 3.16 For God so loved the world, he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And we celebrate on Christmas the fact that God gave his Son that he had finally come into the world to rescue people from perishing and to give them eternal life. And he did this, of course, when he died on the cross, being punished by God for our sins, taking our place on the cross 
and then rising from the dead in victory over death. And everyone who turns from our sin, every one of us, and trusts in Jesus for forgiveness, believes in him, we are forgiven our sins and given eternal life. And we will be with God forever. For those who trust Jesus, the penalty of sin is destroyed. We won't perish. When Jesus died on the cross, he was hurt in a temporary way. He was injured for a short time. Satan was striking his heel. And you might say, wait a minute. He died. Isn't that kind of permanent? Well, usually. But it wasn't for Jesus, of course. Jesus crushed Satan's head by rising from the dead. It was only a temporary thing. And by doing that, he guarantees eternal life for those who believe in him so that we can be with God in heaven. And we're not influenced by Satan anymore. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 says, For by a man came death, and by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. Who are you talking about? Next verse. For as in Adam all die. We all die. We inherit exactly what Adam did. So also in Christ shall all be made alive. All of us who have descended from Adam, in other words, every human, every person starts off separated from God, living for ourselves and heading on that road to death. But if we push our trust in Jesus, we are made God's children. We have a living relationship with God and we're promised resurrection life with him forever. It says there also in Christ shall all be made alive. If you are in Christ, it isn't when we're all in Adam, that's every human, all in Christ, all those who have put their trust in him. So that's not a universal statement saying everybody uh, will be made alive, will be given eternal life. But it's everybody who has put their trust in Jesus. Jesus permanently destroyed Satan's ability to bring death on God's people. He crushed his head. 1 John 3, 8 says the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. What works of the devil did Jesus come to destroy? The power of death has no more hold on God's people. We have life. That's what he's come to destroy. Hebrews 2, 14 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he likewise took, took part, partook of the same things, talking about Jesus, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. So God's promise in Genesis 3.15 was fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus truly gave Satan the death blow. He crushed his head good uh, by destroying the ability to bring death on God's people. Death cannot hurt God's people. Yes, we will physically die. But that is not the end. We will be raised with him. Romans 6 even tells us that the power of sin itself is broken through Jesus Christ. The power of sin in a believer's life, we do not have to serve it. We can, we can uh, submit ourselves to God and we can serve him instead. For all God's people who have put their faith in Jesus, we don't have to serve sin anymore. We can serve righteousness. And Jesus did that as a son of Abraham and a son of David. And he, was, and he is also the promised king, the promised savior. Now, Jesus has even more to fulfill of God's promises. He fulfilled those things. In celebrating Advent, Jesus' first coming, we also look forward to Jesus' second coming because he is coming back. Jesus said he would come back and rule, fulfilling God's promises to, to, to David of a forever king who would physically rule. When Jesus ascended to heaven, after he rose from the dead, he was with the disciples for 40 days, and then he ascended back into heaven. He went back into heaven physically. Two angels told the disciples at that point in Acts 1, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come again in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And this encourages all of us, all followers of Jesus, to be looking ahead for Jesus coming, because he could come at any time. And because of that, we tell our friends, our neighbors, in fact, the whole world about the good news of Jesus and what he's done for us so that we can be ready for when he comes. So as the Christian season is basically upon us, this first Sunday of Advent, we remember God's promises that he made even at the beginning of this world to the first people, to Adam and to Eve. That baby, which is born in a major to the virgin virgin girl named Mary, was the fulfillment of God's promise to send somebody 
who would rescue us from the penalty and from the power of sin. Someone who would rescue us from death and give us life. And as we remember his birth, we also look forward to his return in power and glory when death will be finished with. Sin, pain, and suffering will all be gone. Satan's head will be crushed for good. Now at Jesus' birth, uh, people rejoiced because they were told, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And we still celebrate that fact, of course, today. Telling who we can about Jesus so that, um, that he came 2,000 years ago as a baby, as a Savior. And he's coming again to rule. So as we look forward to his coming, and we can pray with the Apostle John in the book of Revelation. He ended it by saying, even so, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for giving these promises of a Savior, of a Savior coming through Abraham and of a King coming through David, and that Jesus fulfills those things. Thank you for doing that. Thank you that we can put our trust in him and that death for us is not a problem. Even if we end up dying physically here, which we generally all will, um, that is not the end. We will be with you forever. And we thank you for that. Father, just whatever you taught us, whatever you have spoken to us, I pray you will help us to, uh, to listen, to pay attention, and to do whatever you tell us. Thank you for this encouragement. Thank you for sending Jesus, and we can celebrate that now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.